Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, where we talk with martial arts practitioners about their histories and the influence that their practice of martial arts has on their lives. You are listening to the free version of this podcast, which is abbreviated. Help support this program by considering to subscribe to us on Patreon, where you will get four full-length podcasts each month one week before the YouTube release date. The cost is that of about one coffee shop coffee per month. Go to www.patreon.com slash malmag to subscribe. That is www.patreon.com slash M-A-L-M-A-G. If you would like to purchase single full-length episodes of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, visit our Gumroad page at malmag.gumroad.com and that is M-A-L-M-A-G dot G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com. This week I sit down at the Inosanto Academy in Marina Del Rey with a drummer, David Anderson, and we talk about how he got into martial arts and how he's using those martial arts to relate to his profession as a drummer. Sit back and enjoy. Welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast, and today I've got another musician, yet another drummer. Seems like martial arts seems to attract drummers. Well, and guitar <laughs> players, actually, for that matter. Uh, this is a student at the Inosanto Academy who I've known uh, quite a while. A uh, man with a really good talents, played with a, uh, some different bands, and um, always has a big smile on his face anyway. I thought it'd be a very interesting person for everyone to meet. David Anderson. How's everybody doing? All right. Well, what do you want to know? Here we are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, Dave, I guess um, generally we always just kind of start with how did you get involved in martial arts? Uh, let's see. I, well, going back to my childhood, I was kind of a small guy and got, uh, this typical story, picked on a lot. And uh, so I just kind of uh, decided around the age of 16 that I needed to learn a little bit about defending myself. So I kind of took it up then. I started with Taekwondo and I did that throughout college. And then uh, after I moved to, to LA, I kind of laid out for a while because I just couldn't find something that fit. And Where are you originally from then? I am from the state of Oklahoma. Uh, oh, wow. I grew up in a small town called Enid, Oklahoma. Okay, that's funny. I never took you for an Okie and Enid oh, yeah. is uh, the butt of a joke from Bill Hicks. <laughs> well, I was, I, let, me, let me preface that by saying I was born in Chicago. Ah, and, uh, okay. I lived there until I was seven years old, and then my father moved us to Oklahoma, to Enid, where he was from, and uh, grew up in Enid. So I'm pretty much an Oklahoman, uh, or Oki, what they like to say there. Gotcha. And that's where you did your, your Taekwondo? Yeah, that's where I did Taekwondo, in Edmond, Oklahoma, at a place called Pooh's Taekwondo. And a friend of mine that I was in uh, the jazz ensemble with at school uh, was Black Belt. It got me to train there. So that's how I got started in that. And uh, yeah, it's just been... You know, a really cool journey, and mostly why I do it now is just to stay in shape at my age, you know, and... Uh, Not getting picked on anymore? Well, no, that, that's... <laughs> because I'm just such a nice guy. Right. <laughs> and I, but... Uh, that, and you yeah. stop playing at dive bars, so, you know, you don't have to yeah. fight your way out of them. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of dive bars, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm mostly a person that's you know hates conflict and things like that. I don't even like arguing with my wife about what's for breakfast. Well, that's so. just smart. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, mo I mean, mostly my martial arts training is, is for at the age I am now is to stay in shape, and I'm not going to win be in any tournaments or anything like that. But um, I got to say, since you know this is definitely the epitome of the pl of martial arts training, coming here to Nassanto Academy and training here and. Uh, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu has been my big go-to thing that I li really love doing. I started training in that maybe 20 years ago with John Machado, then I laid out for a while, and then I got back into it when I came here with Gary Padilla. And um, it's just been really, really cool. And then uh, training Kali, which was a new martial art for me with you and Guru Inosanto and um, Steve. And that's been really great. And um, so, yeah, I, I find a lot of similarities between what I do with music how it really relates well to martial arts. Wow. You know, um, as far as, especially Kali, uh, when we work with sticks, there's a lot of similarities as far as like combinations go, what we call in drumming or music, music drumming, whatever, slash, um, rudiments, things like that. There's a lot of sticking patterns and mm -hmm. an infinite amount of sticking patterns that we use to create things on the drum set. And you can take that same philosophy with Kali. And when you look at Guru's um, charts, when high, low, high, low, high, low, all the families of striking, it's very, very similar. Mm. And that's what I've uh, really noticed about it the most. Uh, and a actually, 
one of my drumming heroes trains here, who actually uh, inspired me to come over here, he and Michael Dubin, uh, a fellow by the name of Alex Acuna. Yes, sir. We, yeah. I, got, I got three of them in a podcast a while back. <laughs> if you haven't listened to, you should. Yeah. Uh, it's Michael and Alex and Euro. Yeah. Zambrano. Yeah. 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 Alex was like one of my drumming heroes growing up, you know, since the 1970s. And then to, uh, I met him at a Yamaha event some years ago and we kind of jammed together. And then I don't know how we kind of became friends. Uh, we, but we did, and uh, he kind of liked my playing, and I, of course I loved him and idolized him. I saw him with many bands, He's including what... He's kind of like the Guru Dan of drumming. He's he really is. He's so nice and accessible. Yes. I mean, to the point that it sort of surprises you. Yeah, he really is, and um, you know, uh, just going back, the first time I ever saw him was with Weather Report, you mm-hmm. know, the legendary group. And then uh, I saw him play drum set, actually, with Al Jarreau at a concert back in 1982. And um, anyway, it was really great to meet him, become friends with him. So we would get together from time to time and, and do some drumming and then work with sticks and uh, with collie sticks. And that was really cool. So I found a lot of similarities um, between the two disciplines that have really uh, actually helped me with what I actually do. And, mm-hmm. uh, and with the jujitsu training, the breathing and all that, I, I seem to have a little more endurance behind the drum set now at my <laughs> age, you know, so I'm not out of the game yet. But well, that's uh, a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's step back a little bit. Uh, you said so from Oklahoma College, and then after college, you came to Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up in in the small town Enid. Um, I was kind of one of those class clowns, not very serious about school, made very poor grades in school, um, <laughs> CDs and Fs, and uh, but I did take an IQ test and scored extremely high, go figure. It seems but, to work that way. Uh, yeah, I've known I'm not saying I'm smarter like than you. <laughs> yeah, but um, so when I uh, was getting ready to graduate high school, I was kind of directionless. I mean, I knew I wanted to be a professional musician, but I was never in the public school music program, but I was already playing professionally. So um, when I was getting ready to leave high school, then <laughs> I wasn't graduating because I had good grades. They just wanted to get me out of there. <laughs> We don't need you here another year. They had enough year. of your jokes. Yeah, you're going to be, yeah, you'll be 19, almost 20. Yeah, you got to go. <laughs> so, um, we don't like guys with full yeah. Smucker's brother's beards hanging out. Yeah, exactly. You know, so I met this, uh, my high school guidance counselor who I only had one, um, encounter with when I was getting ready to graduate high school. He called me in his office two weeks before graduation. He says, Hey, what are you going to do with your life? And uh, I said, whoa, 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 when you're 17 and you're a kid, you just say stupid I things. Rock. I say, yeah, I'm going to be a professional <laughs> musician. And he says, well, what, he, he says, what do you play? Because I was in the public school music program. And I said, I play the drums. He says, okay. He says, well, I'm not a musician. He says, but I think that um, probably a lot of people that you admire, I would guess, have a lot of formal training and things like that. And I said, well, I didn't say anything. It made me think. I was like, yeah, you're probably right, you know. So he just kind of put that, I only met with him for 15 minutes, but that Mm -hmm. 15 minutes changed my life. So I left there thinking, well, what, if I'm really serious about this, how am I going to get to this goal? I wanted to go to the University of North Texas, very prestigious school uh, Mm -hmm. for, especially for jazz musicians. Unfortunately, not far from where you were. Not far at all. And um, so I, um, I, I didn't have the grades and, you know, and the, or the, nor the money. And so I just played in a couple of bands around town locally for the first two years I was out of high school. And I was going to a small university in my hometown, which was not set up, you know, wasn't a good fit for me. Anyway, long story short, I moved to Oklahoma City. I met a fellow that was the head of the jazz studies department on a gig I was playing. He said, hey, you play really great. If you want to go to school, I'll give you a full ride scholarship oh, wow. and um, you won't have to pay a dime. And I didn't even take an SAT. And so I said, hey, I'm in, you know. So this school, the University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond, Oklahoma, where I went to school, um, gave me a full ride scholarship and I just kind of honed my skill there for five years. And with the goal of knowing that I wanted to move to Los Angeles and be involved in the music scene here. And, um, but also around that time, just to back up a little bit, that's when I got into martial arts. Uh, like I said before with my friend and, um, uh, jazz ensemble with a gentleman by the name of John Kidwell, who um, I think he still teaches Taekwondo, but he lives in Montana now. And, um, you know, uh, just with the whole martial arts thing, I just really, uh, you know, I think we all saw, you know, of course, this is the home of Bruce Lee right here. Right, right. And when we all saw Bruce Lee 
uh, we all, you know, are, the first time I saw Bruce Lee was actually in Batman. <laughs> That's all about <laughs> Oh, I. yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, that kicking and yelling stuff is kind of cool, you know. So we all wanted to learn that, and uh, we would all get out and well, yeah, they're we putting were... their hands and feet through bricks and boards, and like, okay, that's tough. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, and the other thing, another way I sort of gotten it involved in, I guess you could almost say jujitsu. Um, in junior high school, um, my brother and I, we would watch pro wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. And as you know, even though it's, I don't want to, well, it is. It's a show. It's not a, a, a combat. Yeah, the but moves you, are real, but the application, the application that they're doing are... Yeah, yeah. because yeah, if you really crank those holes yes. on, as we know... You, you have a corpse. Yeah, yeah. you're crippled, <laughs> or at least paralyzed. Yeah. Right. So, um, being the scrawny kid that I was, my brother and I would watch Saturday Night Wrestling from Dallas-Fort Worth and the Von Ericks and uh, Killer Carl Krupp and uh, <laughs> Ox Baker <laughs> and all these guys. And then out of New York, Bob Backlund and Bruno, Bruno San Martino and... Um, who else? Uh, superstar Billy Graham. So we were learning all these, practicing all these holds and joint locks and things. We right. didn't even know it, right? So it ends up, I got into a tussle with another kid in my school. And um, there was a move that my brother and I used to practice called the figure four leg lock, right? Yeah. And you step in, you know, and so this kid that was picking on me, this, it happened again. We got into this fight and I just, Somewhere in my mind, I was like, you know, let me try some of these wrestling moves that I've been watching, and my brother and I. And I, I got. You can like think in that dialogue, you know. Yeah, like, you know, like, but it just kind of went in flash. It just got the, this epiphany, right? So right. I slap a figure four leg lock on this kid. Yeah. And, you know, no, it was, it was called saying uncle back then. Right, right, right. In the yes, 70s, right? right yeah. Uncle. Right. And he was like screaming, you know, and, and I didn't even realize because you know it's a very dangerous hold. I mean, you can ruin right. somebody's knee with that. That I know now. Yeah. And I slapped it on him, and he was screaming and crying. And um, so the fight ends. I'm like, you had enough? And he's like, yeah, I've had enough. So he's like, where did you learn that? You know, TV. I'm like, oh, I'm not telling you, because I don't want you to learn it. That's right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was uh, another kind of uh, way that you, you, um, I saw a, like a system of combat right. that might be able to help me defend myself. You know, so, okay. so that's part of my story. <laughs> well, that's really fascinating yeah so it's interesting so you have a bit of a striking background and then you have clearly this interest in in locks and grappling yeah. and stuff so then you come to LA and when was that about uh, I moved to LA in 1990 uh, after going okay. through a divorce and uh, young you there's know, those yeah. there's those yeah. yeah I've been through one of those myself. yeah <laughs> but uh, I got here in 1990 and I came out here with 300 bucks in my pocket and I used half of that 300 bucks, gas prices were cheaper then, to get to LA in my raggedy Dodge uh, Ram Dang, pickup okay, truck. okay, this already sounds like several types of movie plots and movie <laughs> uh, and uh, music videos. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So in my V8, uh, an engine coming across, and leaking we're oil. About every genre of music as well as every genre of film as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know. So I, I drive out here with my, you know, oil leaking V8 gas guzzling Dodge pickup truck with a camper shell on with my drums loaded in it. And um, what else did I have? I had a few of my vinyl records that I brought with me. Ooh, yeah. So I get out here and I, I my friend that offered me a job in his band out here, because uh, the drummer was, and the band was actually from Oklahoma and they had moved out here earlier and the drummers happened to be leaving. And my whole plan at some point was to get to Los Angeles because I knew that I was, I was, I knew I was going to be out here at some point. Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't know how, but I knew that I would be out here. So I get here, come out, I sl I'm sleeping on his couch for about three months and just totally wrecking my neck and back. Yeah. But I'm here now and we're playing a lot of gigs down in Huntington Beach area. And then ironically, because I wasn't known in town yet or anything, I was a new guy in town. So I do my gigs at night down in Huntington Beach and then right up the street from where we are right now it used to be a telemarketing place where they had this telemarketing scam and oh, I answered yeah. this ad in the paper and I was like, well, if I got to stay in LA, I need to get a quick job so I can keep some money so I can stay here until I can get a foothold. Right. So I come in and uh, this job started at 6 a.m. So I'd get off my gig at 2 a.m., sleep for like an hour, get in my truck, drive up from Huntington Beach and come and get on the phone and rip people off for a uh, you know, it I'd toner. almost be shocked. You and I are really close in age, so we're going to say, <laughs> I would really be shocked that if anybody in our sort of Gen X uh, uh, 
generation has not done some stupid telemarketing yeah. job at it least was, for like a week. It was awful, you know, and <laughs> just just the drive coming up. So I'd work from 6 a.m. till noon, go back down to Huntington Beach, take a nap and go and do my gig. So that went on for about two months. And uh, it was literally like you could walk here, like it's two blocks from here. So, um, so I did that and then um, I got an audition with this piano player by the name of David Benoit, a kind of well-known piano pianist in the uh, what they call smooth jazz, although back then it was called contemporary jazz. So mm -hmm. I heard about uh, this opening and I had a demo tape and took it by his office, his accountant's office, and somehow what he tells me is that he had a stack of tapes and mine just happened to be on top while he was getting in the shower and I put together a pretty good demo uh, before I came out here, I went, to, you know, and people said, "Oh, you don't put, you don't hand out tapes to people." I'm like, "Well, I'm gonna buck that idea." And how else do they hear what the hell you yeah, do? Yeah, exactly. You Especially know. as a drummer, you gonna walk around with a kit? Yeah, you know, and also, I mean, I guess that was etiquette, you know, sure. it, you know. But to me, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna bump etiquette, and I'm gonna. So claim ignorance later. Yeah. Yeah. So he <laughs> says uh, he was um, getting in the shower, and he just happened to stick it in, and uh, heard. Um, or liked what he heard, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in the meantime, oh, the other part of the story is that I had moved um, in with some people that lived another two blocks in the opposite direction from here over on Olive Street. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, this is, yeah. A, this is a funny story. So, I lived over there, that's where I heard about the audition. And then the tour manager that I called after I dropped the demo tape off, there had been no communication. And I called him up, I said, hey, my name's David Anderson, I just dropped off a... Um, tape to David's office and they told me to contact you, the tour manager, and, and the tour manager, who's now one of my friends, but mm -hmm. so he says, yeah, well, we're not looking for anybody. He just hangs up on me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and okay, I said, okay. Ironically, the tour manager lived two doors down from where I was staying over on Olive That's Street. I never even, we never even knew that, right? So, That's hilarious. So, um, you should almost heard the echo of the, the, yeah, the phone, phone slamming, slamming right? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, wow. So not to be discouraged, because when you're young, you're still... You'll do anything, right? So right. I end up moving up to Northridge and getting a place in a room, and I'm starting to do a few gigs. And so I, two weeks later, I said, you know what? Let me just call this tour manager guy back and tell him, you know, I know you're not looking for anybody, but I'm now, I'm living up here. I have a new phone number. I just wanted to give it to you anyway in case anything right. opens up. I took that chance. So when I called him back, he's like, Oh my God, we've been trying to find you for two weeks. You know, oh, David wow. heard your tape and loved it. And where have you been? I was like, well, uh, I, here I am now. I said, yeah. if you wouldn't hung up so fast. Yeah, so, <laughs> so they called me in and wanted to hear me play live and audition. And I got the gig. So from oh, that wow. gig, I got a bunch of other gigs, a lot of well-known artists at the time in that genre, the Rippingtons and uh, Kirk Whalen, um, Keiko Matsui. Uh, I played a couple times with Larry Carlton and it kind of snowballed from there. So. That was like my old past, and now I'm, I stay mostly at home and uh, play locally and do sessions around LA and um, I hate going on the road. <laughs> you know, so I can imagine that gets old after 30s for sure, yeah. Yeah, being on a tour bus on roads you know that are bad, that are bumping you around and you can't sleep, and it's just, yeah. and if you're out for three months, you're ready to come home after the second week, and yeah. you're phoning it in. Not to say that you're not having a good time, but uh, you're cranky, you're not getting sleep, you're getting, everybody's getting sick on the tour bus, it's, it's yeah. a mess and everything. But uh, anyway, to kind of bring it back to the martial arts thing, um, there's just a lot of you know similarities that I like with martial arts and um, and music, uh, just the thought process, how to handle different, the reactive ways of handling certain situations in martial arts and music. Uh, I use a lot of, actually since I've been training here, I um, kind of use a lot of the same philosophies that you guys use here with my own students in drumming, uh, okay. as far as like technique and positioning and, and then also like breathing and just thought process of like, okay, you learn this, but you, it's not the way it's gonna happen in a musical situation or in a mm -hmm. real fight, but you're learning a reflex, so you have um, the motor skill to react to whatever situation is, is happening at the time. That, that's a big similarity between music and um, martial arts, self-defense, whatever you, you wanna call it. And uh, I've really you know, learned a lot with that in the last few, I've been here almost seven years now, you know, training, so. And that, that's one of the big you know, benef benefits that I've picked up since I've been here. You know, mm. so. Yeah, no.
Very cool. Yeah. Well, so tell me uh, when you discovered jujitsu then, and, and what made you, I mean, clearly there was an interest in, in the locks and stuff, but what, yeah. what made you go that route, and where, where did you find it, when? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> and everybody, everybody has a similar story. So when I first moved to L.A., I was still like, uh, I had a subscription to Black Belt magazine, and even when I wasn't training, I was always keeping up on who was, you know, doing what. And, right. You know, always watching the Chuck Norris's and the Benny Urquidas's yeah. and the... Um, yeah, I understand the junkie nerd life of that. Yeah, yeah and I Bob totally Wall did. and all the guys <laughs> of the day and Kathy Long and um, yeah. Cheryl Wheeler. I mean, I was just, you know, a fan of everybody. So anyway, in the back of Black Belt, you know, where they have all the little ads, so mm -hmm. the, all the little small ads, not the right. big advertisements, Century right. Martial Arts, but right. the ones that, you know, you oh, I can pay for this ad for like five bucks a month. And right. So I see this thing, the Gracies, you know. You know, there's a picture of Horion and Hoyce. I, and I, I remember these. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't even know who these guys were at the time. So their ad said... We'll take on any martial art, and you can come down, and we'll, you know, I'm paraphrasing what they said, of course, but yeah. uh, we'll take anybody on. And, right. and I'm thinking to myself, well, who the hell do these guys think they are? I mean, like, yeah. I don't, you know, I, I mean, you see that, you know, because at that time in the martial arts, we had, before the UFC, we had this idea, like, you, you learn Taekwondo, or you learn this or that. Yeah. And I remember every instructor that I trained with first said, well, my system is the best, and, it'll, and I'd do this, yes. and I'd do this, you know. Right. You hear that, and then you see a yeah. and System, playing, not the guy. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and, you, and me working in a lot of clubs at the time, and I'd see bar fights all the time, and I'd see like karate guys, starting, and there's some guy that's been bailing hay all day, yeah. you know, and he just picks the karate guy up and slams <laughs> him on the pool table and game over, right? So, um, so anyway, when, with the Gracies, the correlation with that was like, here's just another bunch of guys saying like, well, my system works, and granted, I would always say like, yeah, if you get lucky and you land a kick on somebody, you might, you know, stop them or anything, but sure. what if you don't, you know? So um, anyway, I see this ad and I'm thinking to myself, whatever, you know. And then the first UFC takes place. Mm -hmm. And um, I rented it on a cassette, video VHS cassette, Dinosaur, because you and I right. are old guys. Of course, yeah. Well, hey, it's modern and technology at the time, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I see Hoist Gracie, who is, it, it, he and I are built the exact same way. We're probably about the same height. Mm -hmm. He was... You know, they had him listed at 175, but I'd say he was about 165, you yeah. know. And I watch him go in there and burn through. And, and at, granted, at this time, we're just talking about strictly style on style, not like this now, where everybody's, you know, And this concludes the abbreviated version of the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast. Please click the like and subscribe buttons, as well as the notification bell. Also consider subscribing to the full-length podcast at www.patreon.com dot com slash melmag or purchasing individual full-length episodes at melmag.gumroad.com thank you for listening to this week's episode with david anderson coming up next week an interesting young lady by the name of Janine bertel check out the melmag store at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and click on the store tab there, you will find a full selection of Timmy B's brand sticks for FMA and Kirby Kerbong, as well as Timmy B's and Dos Manos t-shirts. Many more products coming soon. Also, click on our Courses tab to purchase online courses, right now featuring the course in the Dos Manos stick of FMA. More courses to come. This show is produced by Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine. Visit us at www.martialartslifestylemagazine.com and enjoy the free version of our online magazine, with articles, a recommended schools page, and a worldwide events calendar. Music by Jack Al Relic. Martial Arts Lifestyle Magazine and the Martial Arts Lifestyle Podcast are trademarked and copyrighted by TNT LLC. Yeah.